Uh, well, good afternoon, good morning, and welcome everybody to Cardinal Pass uh, State of Digital Marketing Analytics and uh, Top 500 Online Retailers uh, webinar. Uh, my name is Alex Lankshire. I'm here with a number of my colleagues uh, from Cardinal Path. We're actually broadcasting with video uh, so that you can see us. I have uh, uh, on the left hand side of your screen is uh, Nick Iyengar. Uh, Nick is our Associate Director of uh, Digital Intelligence at Cardinal Path. He's been with us for a long time and is one of the principal authors of, the, uh, of this report. Um, and in addition to being uh, uh, really uh, uh, an interesting guy when it comes to looking at data, uh, Nick also lives in Michigan and um, Go Blue, right, Nick? Go Blue, absolutely. Go Blue, right. Um, we also have uh, David Ekman. Uh, David is a colleague of mine, a co-founder and a senior partner at Cardinal Path. He heads our digital intelligence practice here uh, at, at the company and has been working in this space for a, well, quite a long time and uh, deeply knowledgeable about all things related to analytics and data collection. Say hi, David. Hi, everybody. Great stuff. And uh, I also want to let people know that um, we have on the call with us uh, my friend, my co uh, ex-colleague at Cardinal Path, but current advisory board member, Mr. Stefan Amel. Uh, Stefan Amel, as many of you probably know, is a thought leader in the space of analytics. Is one of the first guys to really think about the issue of tag management and write about tag management um, and from both technical and strategic level. And I'm, I'm actually just thrilled to have Stefan on this call with us today. And Stefan, say hello. Thanks, Alex. Uh, pleasure to be here. Good stuff. Well, um, maybe I'll just give you all some background around why Cardinal Path decided that we want to look at this issue. And really what it comes down to is this, is that we're facing really uh, brand new problems in digital and marketing, and these are 21st century problems that organizations have to address, and that is how are we collecting data across our digital ecosystem, what are the tools that we're using to do that, and how are we managing those tools uh, properly so that we're then able to extract information, insight from the data that's collected and share that out to the organization so that we win. Um, the last five years, I mean, Stefan, you know, uh, uh, well, all of us, we know that uh, there used to be quite a wide range of vendors in the analytics space, and we've seen pretty massive consolidation in the course of the last, I would say, uh, five, six years now. And we were kind of interested to understand what does that consolidation look like if you choose as a section of, um, of, of the universe uh, the online top online retailers? Because the thinking is, is that they are investing, they're focused on digital, they're focused on online in a major way. So how are they collecting data? What are the tools that they're doing? Let's get a sense of what that means. The other dimension to all of this is um, is that you know the, the ecosystem is getting more complex, there's a lot more tools available, there's a lot more niching of those tools. In the last few years we've seen the rise really of tag management systems, really in response to the problem set that's facing everybody in this industry, which is there are so many different vendors out there that are providing different tools. All those tools really require us to have um, a tags to be able to track against that. Managing those tags, particularly in distributed large enterprise environments, is a really non-trivial task. It's not sexy. Um, nobody's going to really get promoted for being a good tag manager, um, but it is absolutely critical to an organization's ability to manage its data, make sure it's getting robust and accurate data. So we're really interested to see how organizations are deploying and making use of the tag management systems. And we've seen, again, a lot of consolidation in that space, too. So um, the purpose of today really is to kind of go through the results of this uh, report. Um, it's our first report. We intend to do it on multiple occasions. And this is going to be much more of a conversation than it is uh, us presenting what the report says. And we look forward to getting lots of comments from people who are listening. Um, feel free to do so. Uh, we'll be looking at, the, uh, at them as they roll in. Uh, so please do make use of the ability to ask us questions. You've got four people up here. and. Um, Let's uh, let's begin. Any any questions before we begin, Dick, Dave, or Stefan? Anything you want to say? Let's jump into it. Let's dive right into it then. So um, lots of different findings from the reports. Let's just take a look at the uh, use of analytics platforms uh, within the top 500 online retailers. And so the first thing that we know is that GA, not surprisingly, 
um, is, is kind of leading the pack in terms of number of implementations. We detected uh, 370 of these implementations. Uh, I'm just going to do a sidebar. I just realized something very important. The data that we're presenting to everybody is data that we collected through use of a tool called WASP. Um, it's a tool that many of you know. Stefan actually is the creator of WASP many, many moons ago, which is the, a tool that enables you to go and crawl websites and understand and identify what the tags are that are on those websites. So this data comes from Cardinal Path undertaking WASP crawls across the uh, top 500 retailers. Yep. Back to our story. Um, so uh, Adobe Analytics um, has a deployment to about 41% of the retailers, as you can see here. And we created this third category of other, which is a mishmash of web trends and core metrics and perhaps AngelFish and a few others. And collectively, those things represent about 16% of the uh, total market share. So I don't think there's really any surprises here, but Stefan, you want to say something? Yeah, yeah. Uh, actually, uh, I was going back into my old files and I found, uh, I did a similar story, the top 500 retail sites. So it's important to use the same like apples to apples, right? Mm -hmm. And I actually did that in January 2008. So if we look at the numbers from 2008, GA was at 43% and at the time of nature was a 32%. So, so we see a huge increase uh, in the use of GA, uh, not double, but you know, a huge increase. And on the Adobe side, not as uh, big an increase, but still you know, a good progress. But the other ones, like the other, uh, that becomes just a teeny part of, of the, the, the top 500. So I thought it was an interesting evolution of the market. Yeah, you know, I don't know if there's a if there's a kind of like a headline news story that GA has really uh, taken over um, in terms of deployments, particularly given the price points related to the other ones. Um, but it's remarkable to see to what extent it, it's now there. Uh, Nick, Dave, do you have any comments about this that you want to add to this? Yeah, and I think it shows though over the years, Stefan, from when you did your original uh, study, that there's definitely been some consolidation uh, through the years of market share. So, you know, you talked about, I think it was uh, 34 and, and 40 percent around there. And uh, now you look at 74 and 41, you know, that, that's a much higher percentage of, of the overall uh, sites that we, that we studied that, that across just two platforms versus being spread across many others that may have included core metrics, web trends, Yahoo, all, all, yeah. all these other platforms that played a, a pretty significant role. A lot of that now is really rolled up into these these two primary platforms. Exactly, and also at the time, I think it's worth noticing that 22% uh, of those sites didn't have any web analytics platform, or maybe it was something like web trends with log files. Or but, yeah, with log file based. Uh, today, yeah. it's like virtually everyone has a web analytics tool. Yeah, so. log files are not there. Nick, do you want to add anything? Yeah, I think sort of just echoing the point about the consolidation in the in the space. I mean, it certainly has become kind of that Coke and Pepsi world where there's really two big players. It's interesting that about you know one in six retailers are using um, a tool uh, that's outside of the Google and Adobe uh, sort of dichotomy. But what's interesting yeah, is if you look at, yeah, if you look at, at firms that are exclusively using a tool that's not GA or Adobe, it's virtually zero. I believe there's one um, in the entire top 500 that are using uh, sort of a non-Google Adobe product. Um, exclusively. So although you still see a sort of smattering of these um, around the top 500, it seems like they're at most being used in parallel with one of the more uh, sort of mainstream tools. The other thing is that if you break this down uh, and kind of segment it along the lines of how much revenue these retailers are actually doing, you do see some interesting patterns. So let me let me skip us ahead to that because I'm yeah. curious to get all of your takes on, on this. I think this is pretty interesting. So I just want to point out one thing, uh, Nick. Uh, if you go back to the previous slide, uh, just so people see, uh, 200 plus 370 is more than 500. So clearly there's a plus 16. So we're seeing oh, doubling. Right. Of, yeah. So so that's the other thing is that the the trend towards deployment of multiple tools, uh, which we had noted before, is uh, is still indeed the case. And it's kind of like you know going back to your Pepsi and Coke mm -hmm. analogy. It used to be that you would serve you know, Coke to the people on your dining room table and then you'd serve Pepsi to, to people out on the back porch, right? So, uh, yeah, I'm not sure it's the same <laughs> if, it, if it extends here, but 
um, uh, Dunkin' Donuts and Starbucks. I don't know, you know, but we're 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 still seeing that people are using both. In, in many cases. Yeah, I yeah, call this a lot of dipping. Yeah, exactly. I call it double dipping, like going at the buffet and and you know having a little taste of both products or three, even sometimes three different products, just to see which one g will give you the best number, right? But that, yeah, that just doesn't make sense. Well, it's kind and of and we also see as consultants a number of organizations that use, say, both Adobe and Google, and so they'll use Adobe when they're reporting to the executive or, or reporting to the street. Uh, but internally, what they've found sometimes is because that's got such strict requirements for them to do releases and updates and things like that, that for everyday use and for running tests and things like that, often they'll have GA installed so they can really quickly iterate, make updates, run some tests that maybe for their, their UX team or something like that, uh, and also just a way for... Uh, non-analysts to actually uh, use a platform without uh, quite as much training because sometimes people feel that GA is a little easier to get that sort of quick start in using, though Adobe's made a lot of strides over the last couple of years on their usability. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so this this concept of uh, uh, one that I use to uh, because the, the board and, and corporate are, are tr kind of trust the numbers more than the other Maybe, maybe at play here, and certainly anecdotally that seems to be one of the things. Let's go to the next slide. Um, so Nick, you were starting to talk about the use of the tools uh, by revenue of the various yeah. sites. Now that's actually a really interesting take, so maybe you could walk us through that. Yeah, so, so what you're seeing on the slide here is that, you know, although it, it probably isn't sort of breaking news that, that Google Analytics probably has more implementations than Adobe, what you find is that that story starts to change pretty quickly uh, the bigger the retailer gets. So if you look at the, on the left-hand side here, these are what you might call sort of the smallest retailers in the top 500. Their, their online revenue is between 21 and uh, 38 million. And you notice that, that GA has a big, um, a really big share of the implementations and Adobe not quite as much. But what you see is this interesting pattern where Adobe catches up very quickly to essentially being even with uh, with GA when you get up into the sort of the whales, um, the biggest uh, the biggest retailers where you see it's essentially completely even, right? Um, so I thought that was interesting that you know Adobe really seems to to have their relative strength uh, up there at the the top end of the market. Um, and one of the things that I'd be curious to get everyone's opinion on really is you know what is it that um, what is it that Adobe's offering that seems to be sort of disproportionately appealing to that kind of retailer that maybe that maybe Google isn't offering? Or if they are, uh, there's, a, there's sort of enough inertia or, or lock-in um, with Adobe to prevent sort of higher adoption on GA. So I'd be curious to hear from, from anyone about that. Well, I mean, so I have an opinion, but David, go, please. Okay. Uh, you know, definitely, uh, I think one of the things that we've seen from Adobe over the last number of years is their vision and their ability to sell against their vision of, of a full-fledged marketing cloud that's integrated. Um, historically, that may have not actually been a great, uh, that may have not been a actualized, but over the last few years, they really have brought it together where they have an integrated platform that is quite far along and much more sophisticated than something like Google's platform uh, in the number of, of features and, and ways that it integrates. So whether it's testing and personalization, whether you're looking for a, a DMP type of product, whether you're you know leveraging a, a media um, acquisition tool and things like yeah, that. You know, integrating these things all the way across, and the CMS. I mean, you yeah. can't forget AEM, which sort of really sits at a base to, to this yeah. whole platform. Um, they've really sort of sold that vision and have sort of got to a point now where they really are acting on that vision, and, and you're seeing it come to life. And for you know, large organizations, I think that's a, a very big selling point for them in that they can see that I can start in one place with this organization and grow and, and be on this sort of single platform so I don't have to train people against all these different things. I've got one platform that sort of works similarly or consistently uh, and that I don't have to, and, and that integrates together. And so there's a vision that they can sell. And that vision can also be sold much easier internally, right? When you come in and you say, well, if you're with Google, I need to do an integration project with this CMS, and I need to do an integration project with this DMP and this testing platform. You know, it, they're all separate organizations. With Adobe, it's the same organization. So being able to sort of have that 
a sell of the ROI and value that might come out of that, I think can, can also be done much easier when you're trying to sell upstream internally in an organization. Mm -hmm. Stefan, do you want to add something? Yeah, I think, um, uh, yes, absolutely, uh, David uh, is absolutely right. Uh, and I think the two, the, for me, the two big things that are a little bit more technical are NNC Commerce and BigQuery. Uh, without NNC Commerce, uh, you had to go through so many hoops to, to get a proper e-commerce implementation in place. Uh, now it makes much more sense. And BigQuery is, is definitely the, the, the way to go uh, at that scale. Uh, because you want to have an easy access to uh, the raw data and, and a high volume. Uh, so without those two components, uh, I think GA wasn't there. Uh, now I think, uh, you know, it, either uh, you go with the pure web analytics tool or you, go, you look at the whole family of, of products that are offered by Adobe and that makes for a very interesting uh, implementation or, or, you know, environment to work with. And that sort yeah, of ties I, into where you see uh, core metrics, Stefan, because historically it's been very yeah. well known to uh, for e-commerce and, and being yeah. able to really uh, allow you to analyze against product and, and e-com related websites. So it, mm -hmm. It's not surprising that we do see a couple of those still there in the top ten. Yeah. Well, in fact, if you take a look at that, David, um, uh, you'll see that the, you go from 11% to 16% for the other category. And, and I think that that is, the, is exactly what you're seeing uh, with respect to core metrics and the fact that it is a well-known uh, e-commerce, uh, robust e-commerce platform. I, I think I've also got a different uh, perspective on this. So two things that I think are important to put on the table. The first one is, um, it's not possible to distinguish between uh, GA standard and GA premium, right? So when we do a crawl, all we can tell is it's just a GA tag. Um, and uh, we don't know that it's premium or, or standard. Uh, so I think what we're really seeing also is that as you move up the revenue chain, right, you can probably make a, a fairly easy correlation between more revenue, likely more volume, right? Definitely more hits. And um, so prior to premium being on the market, and remember premium is a fairly new product, right? Prior to premium being on the market, if you were in standard, you, you might be able to get away with standard on the lower end of the e-commerce scale, but if you're going to the higher end of the e-commerce scale, there's no way you can build that on, on, on standard. You're just going to hit all of the limits that are, that are kind of, that block you within standard. So I th think that's why we see this drop up as you go off of four GA, because what we're really seeing is, a kind of a winnowing out of the GA standard towards more of the GA premium. We also know that um, GA premium has been, um, you know, the adoption rate has been going up and, you know, there's been a number of reasons why that's the case. Um, but the problem is, is that if you've got, it's not a problem, it's just a, a reality. If I'm, if I'm a, 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 if I'm managing a digital environment and an ecosystem and I've made an investment in something like Adobe and Adobe is still investing in the product in a certain way, you know, that's a footprint that's very hard to move off of. You've got to have a very, very compelling uh, rationale for moving off that type mm. of footprint. Um, yeah. Yeah. And so it, it, it gets harder and harder to displace as you go up the chain. However, uh, you know, and again at the risk of, because uh, I think that they're good platforms, but you know, if there's a, there is a kind of, um, um, of, a, of, a, of a fashion trend too with all products and and so some of the products on, in the other category are seen as being perhaps less fashionable um, and therefore probably more easily displaceable so I think that's what we're kind of seeing also is that um, premium is probably displacing some of those other ones and uh, the data will, will be interesting to, to, to actually get yeah, down a little bit if more. If we can ever get to where we can identify a GA premium separately, uh, or even Adobe Analytics Premium for that matter, it would be interesting to see of the retailers that have both platforms, uh, how many, if any, of those actually have both Adobe Analytics and GA Premium versus GA Standard. Uh, and that, that can help you sort of really indicate, is GA in there as just a, a backup, or is it something that they're actively using because they are paying for it? Um, so it, it would be an interesting analysis at some point if we can look at that. Because when you look at the numbers, yes, from a, a, a revenue standpoint, Adobe wins out. But just from a general numbers, 
both of them are with seven of the top ten retailers. So yeah. Uh, yeah. it is interesting that if all seven of those were GA premium, then there's quite a number of people that are paying for both, but I don't think that's likely the case. So it'd be interesting to see over the long term. Yeah. All right, well, let's move on and take, and take sort of another perspective on, on the same data. And just a reminder for everyone that's listening in, uh, feel free to chat us in a question on the, uh, the GoToWebinar uh, console. We'll be happy to try to address some of those if we have a little bit of time at the end. So eager to see your questions. But let's take a look at kind of a, a similar, a similar uh, but different look at the same data. So when you look at the implementations, not just by the sort of percentage of the total, but by the actual uh, share of the revenue that's being that's being processed through the implementations, you see a fairly interesting story here as well. So we talked about kind of the duopoly, and it's all, it's sort of Adobe or Google, and uh, certainly you know I think that that's true in the space. And if you look at just the implementations, you draw the conclusion that sort of GA is the pervasive, um, GA is the pervasive tool. Adobe is more specialized. But when you actually look at the the revenue, you see a different story, which is that Adobe actually leads uh, leads GA uh, in terms of revenue. So I'm curious if this sort of corroborates uh, sort of what you'd expected to see uh, in the in the previous slide, or if this actually surprises you. You know what's really surprises me with this slide, Nick, is actually in the other category. Yeah, yeah. Right. The size yeah. of the revenue there relative yeah. to the percent of implementations. Um, that's like, you know, somebody's, you know, are those core metrics uh, in the top 10 and the top two? <laughs> uh, well, one, you know, it, it's really interesting to see such a high number. Well, one of the things to consider there is that, uh, you know, one of, the, one of the items that's lumped there under other is actually homegrown tools, sort of uh, unrecognizable or homegrown tools. And so, uh, you know, without naming names, you can kind of, you can kind of guesstimate who in, in the biggest retailers in the world might be using homegrown analytics. And so that's kind of an interesting piece as well. But it does suggest, right, that sort of the further down you get in the top 500, you don't find, uh, you don't find as many of the core metrics or the web trends or whatever else might be uh, floating around down there. They seem to be pretty concentrated near, near the top. That's a very good point that you make, though, Nick. So we won't be talking about like a certain river in a country in uh, Latin America, right? <laughs> uh, well, and this does back up what you hear. I mean, I've been to the Adobe Summit, Google Summit, and you know all these sort of uh, platform conferences, and and Adobe touts every year the the number of transactions, the volume, the revenue that they put through on an annual basis, uh, as being sort of the top of a of a marketing cloud. So it does tend to sort of drive that home in the data that we saw as well. Yeah, a very robust, very mature kind of penetration within uh, the, the, the top end of that market, for sure. Mm -hmm. So we've been talking a fair amount about kind of what this breakdown looks like in terms of the size of the retailer. We also uh, segmented the retailers in a variety of other ways. And one of the things that I thought was interesting is if you look at sort of the type of retailer that it is, regardless of the size, um, we found some sort of interesting insights here as well. I'd be curious to get your take on this. So. What you're seeing here is uh, Adobe and Google uh, broken down by sort of what types of retailers have these implementations. And you know, at first, I didn't I didn't see anything that was really compelling here. But one of the things that I found was really interesting is over on the right hand side in that last column, when you look at kind of the pure play e-commerce businesses, right? These are retailers that only exist online, right? Web only. You find that there's a pretty stark difference between mm -hmm. the Google penetration and the Adobe penetration. So. What this suggests to me is that the sort of big box retailers that uh, may use, um, that may have, sorry, sort of brick and mortar locations, physical locations, um, they may be more likely to be on uh, Adobe, uh, whereas people that only exist online are much less likely to use Adobe. So I'm kind of curious if that surprises you or what, what might explain that. Well, you know, when I saw this data, uh, I would go back to, I think, the first slide that we looked at, which is that Google is clearly the leader at uh, the uh, lower end of the revenue or uh, uh, size of overall revenue for the organizations. Mm -hmm. And so, again, going back to this unclarity or lack of clarity, whether it's a premium or it's a standard, um, uh, to me, this, this makes total sense. If I'm starting off uh, or I'm, I'm, I'm online only as an online retailer and I haven't made the commitment to go to you know the uh, the the premium version. You know this is going to be my tool of choice. So I, I this makes total sense to me. 
But I think when you, when you look at it like that, just to sort of add on to Alex, is when you look at the web only versus folks that are, have some bricks and mortar, a lot of the bricks and mortar are likely sort of legacy businesses. They've been around a while. They've been here a while. The, the web only, I mean, these are folks that really have likely started up in the last 10 to 15 years kind of thing, right? And, and they've exactly. come from that sort of very small startup mentality, do it quick, do it simple, do it cost effectively. And, and for them, you know, Google would have been, a way, would have been the way to start. Yeah, I totally I agree. Had, that makes a lot of sense. Oh, no, you know I mean? think uh, yeah, I think it, it might be a, a matter also of um, moving a brick and mortar is probably much harder than moving a, a pure virtual uh, player. So they might have started with uh, Adobe, uh, you know, a long time ago, and uh, they, you know, you don't change that as easily as switching a whole platform when you have a brick and mortar, and especially if there's a lot of data integration with. A point of sale and stuff like that. You you don't switch that uh, as easily uh, as when you you are a pure play, and right. it's just a matter right. of changing the tags. And you can well, I, I'm oversimplifying it, but you know it seems to me it would be easier. So I want to shift gears a little bit and, and go beyond just talking about the analytics tools themselves and and move up kind of a level and talk about the TMS, the tag management mm -hmm. systems. But before we do that, a good question came in which was, how do we know uh, what the revenue is um, from these retailers? And so we didn't just ask them really nicely. Uh, we, used, uh, we used the IR500 report, uh, which basically gave us the list of who these retailers are and their estimated, uh, estimated online digital revenue. And then using WASP, as, as Alex mentioned earlier, we then kind of took that data and then married it up with the data that we generated, which is which TMS are they using, which web analytics tool are they using, et cetera. So speaking of TMSs, let's let's shift gears and talk about that a little bit. I think we have some really interesting findings and um, and some good discussion that we can have here. So let's let's take a look um, at the TMS sort of TMS landscape. And uh, Alex or or Dave, do you want to kind of maybe just give a quick overview of who some of the big players are here? Dave, I'll leave that to you. Sure. Um, well, we know Google entered the market a few years ago, but at that point, it had already been sort of around for a while. And we have folks like Insighton, uh, Atelium, Signal, uh, and even uh, Adobe's Tag Manager, which, which came from a Satellite. These tools have been around for, for a number of years already when Google entered the market. But as usual, Google coming in with sort of a free product and already having the market share that Google Analytics has, we've seen extreme growth from that uh, platform. So it's been very interesting to see sort of the disruption in the marketplace in the last few years, which I'm sure we'll sort of get into when, when we get down to the, uh, the overall uh, sort of breakdown that, that we saw as we looked across the platforms. And, you know, definitely a TMS now, when you are looking to deploy tags on your website. Don't just think analytics, but these are tags of any type because these manage any of those JavaScript tags you're deploying. A, a TMS is really something that almost every web and, and digital property should be looking at using as they move forward because there is a, an ability to add that flexibility and, and a ease, ease that release process and, and also put the power of it into whether it's the Adobe um, much much closer to parity with Google in terms of the implementations. And one of the things that I started thinking about was just switching costs, right? Even if you wanted to switch from Adobe to Google or or vice versa, um, that can that can involve a fairly uh, extensive sort of short-term costs, right? So switching costs can be high. And one of the things I've been wondering about is sort of whether tag management tools actually have an impact on that. So are switching costs higher or lower um, with the advent and sort of more pervasive impact of tag management systems, or conversely, does a TMS actually sort of promote vendor lock-in and 
key and actually keeps you even more uh, locked into the analytics tool that you've chosen. So I'm curious if anyone has any thoughts on that. Yeah, I, I think, uh, we, you know, from a cardinal path perspective, we've seen a number of, of organization starting with one TMS and, you know, a year later switching to a, a different one. So I think there's there's also, there's the, uh, the beauty of thinking that you can deploy a TMS and then you're going to be able to switch your web analytics platform very easily. But there's, at the same time, there's a different, line, different type of lock-in, which is, uh, locking in with a specific tag management vendor, and and if ever you have to switch, uh, especially in a market where there's a lot of acquisitions and changes, uh, you might end up deploying a tool and then a year later having to to redeploy because it got acquired, it got uh, it, it died, or, uh, or or simply there's just a new release of that platform which uh, it it it's, uh, it doesn't happen very often, but uh, you might have to redeploy your TMS tags if ever there's a big release of the TMS platform itself. Um, so yes, it makes things a lot easier, but there's, uh, you know, it's still, uh, there's no magic, sadly. Stefan, I think sometimes, I, I'm sorry I, I, if I got cut off yeah. there in my last bit, but uh, sometimes I think though that there is that tendency for organizations to look at technology to solve their issues mm -hmm. and often in that case where they look at a tag manager and say well it just isn't working I have to change it actually comes down to more internal <laughs> issues than the platform itself there's things yeah. like governance and and having the right people trained up properly to use the platform and the tool and and make sure that you have all these pieces and processes in place to actually really leverage the platform to the best that it can be yeah Switching tools doesn't always necessarily solve that problem, and all you're doing is just buying yourself some time to make it seem like the problem is not uh, you, but it's, it's not internal. Yeah. But in the end, you'll find that even moving to the new tool, these same issues will surface up, you know, six months later again. Yeah. Oftentimes, I, when I'm, I'm speaking on, on stage, I, I, I mention, you know, the, the joke that. You know, when it's the third time you switch your web analytics or TMS platform, maybe the problem isn't the tool, the problem is you. <laughs> yeah. So maybe we should jump into the, the data here and see, uh, see what yeah, we saw. Absolutely. So I thought this was one of the most sort of interesting findings of the research that we did, which was that when you look at these top 500 retailers, uh, fully 42% of them are not using a TMS yet. And this is the kind of thing that we went back and, and double-checked and numbers again, just, just to make sure, because it just didn't seem like this could possibly be true, yeah. and, and yet um, here we are. So I, I think a, a really big question here is, you know, what is it that, what is it that explains a, a major retailer not making the jump uh, to adopt a TMS? Uh, you know, I'm going to jump in here and, and you know, state my, my truth. I, I mean, this was one of the things that came out of this uh, report that just, you know, I I, I instantly felt uh, a high degree of, of uh, um, kind of like sadness for those 42% that were managing, you know, top online retailers without a TMS. Uh, because the truth of the matter, my, my friend Dennis Mortensen uh, once told me when he was trying to uh, drum up sales for his uh, tool called Visual Revenue that he would go to uh, companies and before going in he would take a look at the number of tags that were on their sites and sometimes they had 50, 60, 70 tags on their site and he knew that he had you know, a bit of an upward climb to ask for another tag on that site. Uh, and you know, it's just not uncommon that we see most major sites with well in excess of 30 tags and so to imagine that they're maintaining a production uh, rhythm and release and while managing all of these tags, which are you know have their own kind of updates and stuff going on, without some kind of centralized uh, uh, tool to do that, it, it just it, to me it's it's, it's I, I can't imagine what it must be to to work in that environment. Yeah, but can there be another explanation for that? Like uh, yeah. like we we mentioned that the top. Uh, retailers might have their own homegrown solution. So what I suspect is out of those 42%, there's probably a, a number of those that have their own homegrown way of managing all of those tags. 
Uh, yep. I'm sure they don't manually go into pages and copy and paste the tags over and over again. They must have, you know, uh, different means of deploying those tags. So, well, I let's agree. let's cross our fingers and hope that's the case. Well, no, so I agree. So I I don't think I think 42 is hot. First of all, I, I think 42 reflects the fact that you know, if you think about analytics and if you think about just tags in general related mm -hmm. to uh, products. Uh, those have been around for a long time. TMSs as a product category are relatively new, five years, you know, kind of ruinous, right? So I, I, if you are facing that problem and you're at a larger organization, you probably build some form of solution to manage mm -hmm. that. I think that that's, you know, is that is that five percent? Is that twenty percent of this forty-two? I, I don't know, but but I gotta believe that there's some of that in there. You know, I'll come to something else and. And Stefan, you know, we talk about digital maturity all the time. It's something that uh, you know you really pioneered years and years ago, and we've we've, we've maintained as kind of central to the way that we look at the business at Cardinal Path. And I, I can say, and I think we we can all kind of go mm, yeah, that that organizations that don't have a TMS in place assume they don't, right? So it's not homegrown. It's like they don't have a TMS in place. Um, that to me reflects probably a deeper systemic aspect of how the organization is functioning and probably said they're at a lower maturity level because it would be the type of thing that you just say, I, I, I got to do this. This is just something that we need to do. And for me, from the perspective of being nimble and agile, uh, to not have them in place also means that you're probably baking in a lot of brittleness to the systems and governance within that organization. So there's just there's just really no compelling reason in 2015, 2016 to not be using. I think this is kind of one of these fundamental tools. I will bring up one final thing before I'll let somebody else take the floor, and that is, Stefan, years ago you and I talked about um, that TMS is deliver a promise but at a cost. And the question is, what was the cost? And the cost was now you've got a single point of failure, right? The single point of failure. Um, I think that's no longer as much of an issue as it was that we thought it was. Uh, you know, for redundancy and all that type of stuff, but but maybe that's kind of a legacy issue out there because there's got to be reasons why people have not proceeded to, to implement this. So when you think about these organizations that don't have a TMS, and if you look closely at these numbers here, you find that actually a, a substantial proportion of them are essentially attempting to manage multiple analytics tools, um, let alone uh, conversion optimization, uh, digital marketing, conversion pixels, all that kind of stuff. You know, multiple analytics platforms with no TMS. So I'm, I'm trying to just paint a picture of this. I mean, are these organizations where maybe um, IT is kind of ruling with an iron fist and they're preventing TMS adoption? Is it that um, marketing isn't convinced that there's a need for a TMS? Is it something else? What have you just in your experiences with working with a broad variety of organizations? Is, do, do any of those sound like they're sort of uh, a common cause, or is it is it just too is it too hard to say? Is that everyone is unique? I think the uh, to Alex's point about single point of failure, I think uh, that isn't the case. Uh, but I still hear perception of, oh, is it going to slow down? Oh, uh, is it going to give too much control? If we think of an IT environment uh, where IT is very powerful, uh, oftentimes there's that argument that I don't want to give the control to other people who might just break the page by injecting the wrong tags and stuff like that. But but you know, there are ways to manage those uh, environments where there's, actually it's even better. I've made the case to uh, a financial institution that they were better off using a tag manager uh, for security reasons and uh, 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 traceability and all those aspects rather than, than not using it. So I, you know, I would be ready to argue against anyone uh, for you know the promotion of using a TMS, even in the case where there is security and and you know uh, a, a, a strong IT control. Uh, to me, it's just so obvious. Yeah, those are good points, Stefan. I mean, things like latency and security are, are really common ones. But also, when you're starting to look at uh, large retailers, large organizations, change is hard when you talk about IT, right? And so. Uh, in a lot of cases, you know, if nobody's complaining, or at least from the very top, nobody's complaining. If it ain't broke, don't fix it, right? And and so there's sort of that attitude of, well, well it's working fine. Now that may not be what 
people in say marketing or people that are trying to use the platform feel but uh, in a lot of cases you know as, as we all know working with our client organizations trying to get time from a, an IT department to even just work with us to put in say a data layer to support a tag management platform that can be something that has to be planned out six or eight months in advance with some organizations it can be really hard right and so uh, sometimes like I think that has a bit of a restrictive uh, ability on people's inertia and uh, sort of want to go through that entire process yeah it's almost like the pain of, of uh, not having a TMS has to kind of filter up to, uh, to the leadership enough before there's a the sort of momentum to, to move. Uh, well, it's going to outweigh the pain of going through putting a TMS in. Exactly, <laughs> exactly, exactly. <laughs> that uh, that short-term cost has to be weighed against sort of the long-term the long-term gain, right? Yeah. Well, let's look at kind of what the TMS landscape looks like for those for those organizations that are using a TMS. Um, it's interesting, you know, it's a, it's a much more diverse space, right, than the analytics platforms themselves. There's a lot of players here. Um, and this one I thought was interesting. You know, you have you have the free option in GTM, so not surprisingly, uh, you know, free products. So, say that again, Alex? And DTM. Right, right. So, you know, never a surprise when, when, a, when a free product does well from a market, a market share standpoint. Um, that, that's uh, not, not too surprising. But it's interesting here. I mean, I'm, I'm curious what... Um, what the outlook is like uh, in the TMS space. Um, do we need to have this many tag management tools? Uh, are we going to end up in more of a Coke and Pepsi world? Or what, what's the future hold here? Uh, from my perspective, I think, you know, tag management is still a, a sort of nascent industry. It's, you know, go back a number of years in analytics, uh, and that's sort of where we're at with the, yeah. with the tag management. And so definitely there's going to be some consolidation over the years you're going to come out with probably a, a couple one or two paid vendors that are at the top and one or two free vendors that are at the top you know it's sort of like we are now with analytics where uh, GA is sort of the free one that really is overriding everything and then we've got a couple paid ones like Adobe and Google as well so definitely I think over the years there's going to be some consolidation but these Particular, I mean, this, this whole market it, from the sort of features, capabilities, things like that, they're still really changing every year. What they're able to do, what you're able to do with these tools, because because they collect all these tags, um, there's some pretty powerful functions that they're able to do now, but are likely going to be able to do in the future. So I think it'll be really interesting to see where things are going. Yeah, well, you know, I think, uh, uh, David, that last point, if I could just build on it uh, briefly, what we're seeing, I think, more so in the TMS space than in the analytics space is we're seeing these products kind of, I mean, they're, they're, they have a common core, right? But the, the feature set around them has really changed. I mean, like, so, for example, Telium's got the replay thing that, that you can go into, it, and that's really good. And Sighton has brought in some of the Tagman uh, t uh, technology, and it and now gives you vision view across the, the marketing stack as well, right? So Signal does it. So I think what we're seeing is, is there's a lot more, um, uh, you know, uh, let's say flavors within each of these tag managements. and. And, and clearly Google doesn't do those things, right? Google is, is about like we're going to manage tags and we're going to enable you and, and focus first and foremost on a few things. So there, you know, you can, I think they all do the core thing well. It's, it's whether or not the organization wants some of the other added benefits on top of it. And, you know, this kind of loops back to something that we were talking about earlier on is, you know, overbuying for the capabilities of the, or, of the maturity organization, right? It's, it's like, yeah, some of these other things are fan freaking tastic in what they can do, but does the organization have the uh, internal capabilities and capacity to really leverage those features and derive the benefit that they deliver? Because I, I believe they do provide benefit, but we're, we're seeing a lot of overbuying still. And that again goes to the uh, sort of early years of the industry, it's very much like what we would see um, 
five or six years ago with the Adobe platform. You'd have these awesome salespeople come in, talk to an executive, sell the entire cloud to somebody, but they've got one analyst on staff, and, mm -hmm. and there's no way that person can use all that. And so they invest millions of dollars in a platform that just doesn't generate the ROI for them. And that's similar here. If you don't have the people and processes to go along with the, the tools you're investing in, you know, you're just not going to be able to sort of garner that ROI. But, I mean, these tools, it is really interesting that they are moving in a similar direction with the paid platform. So now you look at the top ones like Telium, Insighton, uh, Signal, they're all building their back-end data platforms, right. uh, sort of like the ability yeah. to build a, a first-party DMP yeah. Yeah. Uh, of, with all your customer data, but incorporating all of that data that's coming in from all the tags as well. So, yeah. you know, you can upload your back-end data, but also incorporate all that online data from web, mobile apps, you know, all these different places. And so really allowing you to sort of see that sort of connection of pieces across all these different platforms in a way that's different than just using analytics because now you're you're really pulling in much more significant data about these folks and able now for example with Telium they have their audience stream product you can connect those back into things like double click and and other advertising platforms so that you can start retargeting against all of that yeah the, the barriers are, are, are kind of melting away. I, Nick, I know we have a number of questions, right? And I think we should really try and get to those questions since we're about uh, 10 minutes to the top of the hour. So, uh, uh, Stefan, did you want to add something before we get into the questions? Oh, uh, well, just, uh, you know, if I read this right, it means that some of those retailers are using more than one TMS. Right. Exactly. Right. Which is which is scarier than using multiple web analytics platforms. Well, let's talk right, so about that. That's a great that. segue. That's, that's a great segue. segue. So, so you know, when we were going through the raw numbers, it wasn't a surprise at all mm -hmm. to see retailers using multiple analytics solutions because, you know, we, yeah. we all work with organizations like that every day. What was more surprising was to see that there are organizations using multiple tag management systems. Mm -hmm. So kind of a two-part question here. One is just my own question, selfishly, um, and one is from the, the audience. So kind of a two-parter here. Why would an organization want to use more than one TMS, and what are the, what would be the sort of benefits of, of doing so? So I can start off with sort of what I've seen with some clients that, that do do that. And a lot of the times it's their way of addressing certain types of security issues. So they have a, a corporate TMS that they'll be using for their platform. But maybe they're working with a, a, a media organization such as a, a Starcom, any media organization out there that is running uh, campaigns through DoubleClick or other ad platforms. That organization wants control to be able to start tagging with the floodlight tags and everything else. They don't want to give those folks direct access to their uh, primary TMS. And m many uh, tag management platforms are challenged to put two copies of their tag on a single page. Yeah. And mm -hmm. so they look at saying, great, I've invested in Insighton or Telium or something like that. That's our corporate. You know what? We're going to put GTM on here so that these people can deploy the tags they need to. Yeah, and now and now you can have two GTM container on on the same instance. So so that alleviates that uh, that aspect. And we're also seeing better workflow and yeah. management around permissions that yeah. are allowing people to do this all within the same tag. Yeah. But um, those are still sort of up and coming, not just in GTM, but even in the other mm -hmm. platforms. And yeah. so you still see people looking at a way around. How can I give more control to my agencies or consultancies or mm -hmm. other departments in my company, but still have sort of IT or, or whoever owns the corporate TMS uh, remain full, retain full control there? What I wonder is how many of those are running two TMSs but because they are investigating or in the process of switching from one to the other. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, good, you know, yeah, you know I, I, that that's probably you know I'll just say that that in in the work that I've done um, about uh, and I think also let's let's look at the audience here. It's like top online retailers, so it's pretty certain that they're also going to be doing a lot of advertising. They likely will mm -hmm. have media agencies, and in every one of the larger clients that I've dealt with, 
the aspect of having multiple containers, but one that they're giving off to the agencies, yeah. so they stay out of their sandbox and they keep things very separate, mm -hmm. has been the driving force. So just to echo what David said. Mm -hmm. So another question that came in uh, from the audience, and I think it's a really good one, and uh, would love to hear from from all of you if you have thoughts on this. Is you know, to what extent are there still concerns around uh, kind of adopting the Google sort of analytics stack, you know, GTM and GA, um, when it comes to kind of using that to capture your own first party data, but then having Google um, sort of use that for things like benchmarking, um, various forms of sort of anonymous data sharing. Does that come up as an an objection or a pain point uh, for for organizations that are considering the Google stack, or have you, have you not heard as much about that lately? It no, does no. come up, but yeah. there, there's always ways to talk to that. Google actually gives you a lot. If, if, you're a, if you're on GA Premium, well, even on Standard, Google gives you a lot of control about what they're allowed to do with their data. So if you don't want Google using your data for benchmarking, you can turn that off within GA settings. If you don't want Google, uh, integrating or you know sharing data across any of the other platforms in its in its uh, stack, you can turn that off. There are consequences of making those changes. So, for example, if you don't allow them to share data with other uh, platforms in their stack, then you can't do the AdWords integration. But you do get that full control over how you can use their data. But we do also see a lot of clients that have a bit of. Uh, uh, I don't know what I call it, paranoia or fear that, you know, data that's going into their analytics, Google might use against them. Uh, and, and there is some of that, particularly if it's an organization that competes against Google. They are very cautious about using those platforms and tools and whether they actually want to have, their, whether it's shared or not, just plain having their data go there. Stefan, do you want to add anything? Well, no, I think uh, I, I would pretty much echo what uh, David was mentioning. Uh, you know, it's uh, at one point there's uh, ways of doing business that if they were, if Google was abusing their privilege, um, they would be out of business. Like to me, it's just uh, you know, it's a uh, urban legend that Google would be spying on on your your own web analytics data and and stuff like that. Uh, well, for that matter, maybe they don't even have to do that. They, <laughs> they have other means of knowing, you know, through searches and through other means. Uh, they can, uh, yeah. If, if that's really what they wanted to do, it, it would just, it doesn't make sense for me to, to do that. Yeah, I think one thing I heard one time is, you know, Google's got to be like a bank with your data. And if somebody breaks into the bank and steals that data, you're going to lose all trust in that organization to, to, to house any of your data. So um, what I actually see from Google is they actually take a much more conservative approach than most other organizations when it comes to privacy and security of your data. So if anything, I almost trust Google a little more than other organizations yeah, it was good. without that data being used. Because they, even in, in Google Analytics as an example, they provide very specific limitations as part of the agreement you sign with them of what data you're allowed to send into Google Analytics. Other organizations have recommendations, but not necessarily hard limitations that are part of a legal agreement like Google yeah. does. You know, I, I just, because uh, we're short on time here, I, I, my, my perspective is this, is that I think we're worrying about the wrong thing. I think that the tools and the way the tools manage data is pretty locked locked down. I have no fear that the people that are you know that are provisioning tools to uh, the end users uh, are making sure that those tools uh, manage data in ways that align with good business ethics. I think where the real issue is how the end users then you know, monetize, sell, manage those cookies and share those with other people, right? That, that to me is where the, the issue lies, not necessarily with the tool that does the measurement on the site. I'd be much more concerned about yeah. that. And in fact, I would, I would probably worry more or, or, or look Very deeper into the other tags that are firing on those. Yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, because sometimes a, uh, just a clever, you know, it looks interesting, a clever widget or a little something that you add to the site, and, and through Wasp, that was one of the things we realized is that sometimes you, you know a single uh, little JavaScript include will uh, in the in in the back will fire a bunch of tags 
I would worry much more about that than than how Google or Adobe are uh, potentially not using the data because they, they are not doing it, right? Yeah. Nick, uh, are we are, are we kind of leading home? So I think we should probably leave it there. Yeah, we we do have some questions that came in that we we don't quite have time to to answer, but we will follow up and uh, and get answers out to those of you that that had a question that we didn't have time to to get to. Yeah, all I right. think the four of us could talk all day about this kind of oh, stuff. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. You're gonna have don't to cut us. us off sooner or later. Yeah. <laughs> well, look, you know, it's amazing. Uh, poof! What happened to the hour? It's disappeared on us. Um, Interesting stuff. I want to say thank you, Nick, and the rest of the team that you worked with, or that uh, you know you you did to to pull together this uh, this report. It's actually pretty interesting stuff. Um, we'll be updating this on a regular basis at Cardinal Path. Um, I want to say thank you, Stefan, for years ago yeah, thinking right. about this thing about how do we how do we actually crawl these sites and understand what's on and having the genius to develop WASP and, uh, and kind of see the evolution of that project must, must feel good, but uh, um, thank you for that and for being part of the panel. We appreciate yep. your time. Mm -hmm. uh, David, you know, always, uh, always a pleasure. Um, uh, every time I listen to you, I, I feel uh, less smart and I learn lots more, so it's a good thing, good thing to have you on the, on the panel. Um, and with that, I want to say thank you to everybody that attended today's webinar. Uh, we appreciate that you took the time to, to sit down and listen to this. Um, hopefully you found something interesting, learned something new. Um, feel free to reach out at any point in time to Cardinal Path. The information is on the, on the site slide in front of you. Thank you very much for your time. And to everybody, happy holidays and best for 2016. Cheers. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Alex. Bye-bye.